I'm terribly sorry. No, 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 no problem. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. As, as we don't really have that much time, I will just move uh, straight into the questions. Um, Marek Belka has impressive experience, both as, a, as the economist as, as a as a politician. And my first question in the panel would be to you. Um, you, you were leading the country, you were um, helping uh, to uh, shape the strategy of uh, um, reconstructing uh, Iraq, and you have extensive experience uh, in Ukraine. And having these two perspectives, you as an economist and you as a person who was leading the country as a politician, what's your view on the current crisis, especially what's your view on, on Russia, how long Russia can sustain sanctions, how long Russians can accept such a price, and is there an, a perspective of finishing this crisis that would be accepted by the politicians and it would be um, accepted by the economists? Okay, let's start with Russia. Um, well, uh, I'm quite pessimistic as to whether the sanctions can have a, an immediate impact on, uh, on Russia. As Ivan Krastev, one of the eminent uh, policy analysts of today, says those countries who have, mm, let's say, societies that are um, resistant, that, that uh, are not vulnerable to, to change, those win, in the short run at least. So here is my pessimism. Well, but it does not mean that the sanctions are not necessary and not working. The most important thing is, of course, to make, uh, especially Europe, independent on Russian um, deliveries of fossil fuels. And in this respect, of course, the most, by far, the most important uh, uh, development of the last days is the decision of the European Commission to reduce the dependence of Europe uh, by two-thirds by the end of this year. Well, of course, the media are overwhelmed by the news about the embargo imposed by Biden. Nice but completely irrelevant, uh, or uh, even UK, come on. UK can do without uh, Russian gas and oil. Europe cannot, continental Europe. And if this decision to reduce the dependence of, of the European Union by two thirds by the end of this year is realized, this has a potentially devastating impact on the Russian economy. So, let's keep it in perspective. What is important and what is media important? Uh, now, Ukraine. Well, what we can say about Ukraine, of course, depends, uh, depends on, uh, on the war, on how long it will be, uh, what will be the end, the end game. The most important thing for, there are two important things now for, for Ukraine we can do. Three important things. One, military deliveries, and they are going on, except for those uh, hapless uh, uh, airplane deliveries. Second, to take care of, uh, uh, of those uh, masses of, of, of refugees. Uh, and number three, to give political support to, to Ukraine by granting them the status of candidate country. Candidate country does not mean a lot in terms of every, every day's business, but it's a huge blow to Russia. Because the whole thing 
in this war is to prevent Ukraine being a part of Western world. Because without Ukraine, you, Russia will never be a European superpower, superpower. So these three things have to be done now. Then, in the longer run perspective, we have to mobilize resources to rebuild Ukraine. To rebuild Ukraine. Well, you have mentioned Iraq. Well, you have to have money, of course, but you also have to have leadership. One country leading the effort. In the, in the case of Iraq, I mean, I don't want to get back to Iraq anymore, but the problem of leadership didn't really exist. It was those who had invaded Iraq. In the case of Ukraine, it has to be, well, we don't know, U European Union, probably. But it has to be in close cooperation with the, with the United States and Canada. Don't forget Canada in this respect. So we need leadership and we need money. Where this money come from? Well, we have just frozen two billion, uh, $200 billion of the, Euro, of the, of the Russian banks, central banks' reserves in, uh, uh, in Europe. It's, I was told, it's entirely within international law to sequestrate this money and use it to rebuild Ukraine. So you have a, a program for Ukraine and appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pavel Boris, um, the, the question as well on your view on what is the impact of the uh, Russian war on Ukraine on Polish, European and global economy. But I, 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 I would like to um, uh, uh, tell the audience uh, and, and you about the conversations I had with the Polish entrepreneurs in the last few days. They were ex surprisingly positive about the perspective they are, uh, that, that, that are ahead. They believe that the refugee crisis is actually the chance for Poland to repair the broken labor market and the, the future of reconstruct, reconstructing Ukrainian economy is a great possible opportunity for the Polish businesses to cooperate, invest, and build the deeper cooperation with the Ukrainian economy. Do you think that that optimism is based on, on the reality or is it just wishful thinking? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I believe that it's very difficult now to have the optimism when we are looking what is going on in Ukraine. And I also believe that this anecdotal evidence doesn't tell the whole uh, story. Uh, so um, we have to understand that what is going on now, we have severe and long-term implications. So this is not the short term cost, but it, have, it would have a tremendous uh, um, impact on the global, on European economy and the Polish economy. The second, it is not about only the war in Ukraine. Actually, we have to consider from the economic perspective that both what was going on in the economy for the last three decades and especially last decade in terms of monetary policy what, what happened with COVID and now what is happening uh, in terms of the war, we will reshape the, 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 the global economy uh, significantly. So regarding the costs on Russia side, European <coughs> side, I estimate that assuming 10% recession in Russia this year, the total cost for Russia of the sanction would, would amount at least $250 billion. 10% recession, the, uh, the loss of the value of the companies uh, on the global markets, the uh, assets which were seized abroad, so at least this is $250 billion. So this is huge cost which actually is much higher than the total GDP of Ukraine. And the sanctions are well designed because they are hitting 
the heart of the economy, which is the financial system, and it was paralyzed quite quickly. But of course, we need to understand that uh, there are also costs on the, on the European side, on the West side, and the key consequence, the, 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 the key cost is in inflation. Yeah? Uh, the whole concept of working with Russia, of cooperation between Europe and Russia, was based on the assumption that the economies are complementary. So, okay, Europe is producing more value added services, products, and ex imports resources from Russia. Hoping that at, this, at the same time we will promote the democracy of Russia, which the concept has failed. Now, Europe has to become independent in terms of the resources. It will last, and we are talking about many types of resources from metals to oil, gas, and it would result in higher prices, so uh, inflation. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the key war is between, economic war is between China and US. And the whole concept of globalization, I believe, is coming to the end. Um, and we are coming, uh, we are starting the era, the era of regionalization. So the there will be a significant shift in the global trade driven by different approach to the security, which we recognized during COVID and now during the world, that too much, we are too much dependent in pharmaceutical sector, in many sectors, in terms of supply chains for uh, importing goods from China. And this shift so the nearshoring near that the, the production will be, will be going to Europe and, and US also create the inflationary pressure. So these two elements means we, are, we have entered during COVID actually, uh, I believe the decade of turbulence, which means higher inflation, a decade, a decade which means higher inflation, higher interest rates, um, uh, different, uh, um, uh, different um, uh, concept of global cooperation, in, so the, the changes in, in global trade, uh, and completely uh, uh, complete change in, in, in European energy uh, policy, which also means the faster um, energy transformation. For Poland, there are pros and cons, as always. Uh, as you have indicated, of course, we have labor shortage. So some of the, uh, the, this, the, 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 the refugees could uh, help in this respect. Um, however, at the same time, on the financial markets, we see that we are paying now the higher risk premium because the perception of the country has changed a little bit. So uh, we have to also fight with the inflation, which will cost uh, lower GDP growth for the next year. So the cost will be there. It is manageable. It will last. Um, um, but um, uh, what is, I think, most important now, that we should be ready to bear this cost and we should further um, strengthen the, the sanction against Russia and we couldn't allow that this type of policy is uh, um, acceptable. And we can't come to the uh, business as usual with Russia quickly. This is, would be most important because, you know, this is just the regime which is conducting the crime wars and I can imagine that we could come back with the normal trade relation quickly. Thank you very much. Um, devastating effect on the Russian economy, as Professor Belka said, severe and long-term impact on the economy. This is the, the words of Pavel Boris. Um, the question to, to Mr. Trombinsky, how is this um, uh, effect that we are seeing over here is going to transmit on the global economy? What, what will be the channels of the transmission of this impact? 
Yes, thank you, Marek, and thank you for having me today. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here and uh, such a pleasure to be among such a uh, notable pe uh, speakers. Uh, so, first of all, uh, if I may start a little bit about the sanctions, I think uh, um, I, I agree with my predecessors, uh, both with uh, Professor Belka, who said that sanctions do not have immediate effects, but also with, uh, with Pavel Boris, who said, yes, the effect will be will be devastating on Russian economy, but it will also be devastating for some other countries. Um, and uh, I'm very careful about assessing the impact because we do not know much at this moment. And uh, we know that the impact will be huge, but it will be uneven. It will be very uneven for different countries. It will be very uneven for different regions. And why is that? Well, if we take today's Financial Times, we can see West cuts trade ties to punish Putin. Well, the problem is, uh, since the crisis started, since the war started, uh, there were 29 measures implemented by 12 countries and one supranational organization against Russia in, for nine different sectors. So if we start making estimates, uh, we can see the direct effects of sanctions. We try to uh, somehow quantify this effect, but then we have no idea what the compound effect of sanctions would be. The, the, the sanctions uh, imposed alone, they cause some stress, but sanctions imposed together or subsequently have a totally different effect uh, on, on the economy. Um, and to say about the effects for, for, the, for the global economy, I think there are several channels of transmission that we are aware of at this moment. Uh, first, uh, increasing the commodity prices. I would exclude energy and food prices from this, but in general, traditional commodity prices will go up. Energy prices, we already see, are going up, and they will be going up. And food prices, since Russia and Ukraine is responsible for 25% of the global food production, will surely go up, and that will have a devastating effect on some regions that were importing food from Russia and Ukraine and will have to challenge uh, significant food shortages and uh, very high food prices in the future. Uh, and then we have two additional channels. Uh, one was already mentioned, is uh, the refugee channel from uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this is a challenge for them in the near term. It might be an upside as well as uh, Pavel said before me, uh, like for the Polish economy, given the labor shortage, that might be very, very positive but that would require probably some, some policy action. And then we have uh, the last channel, which is not very well understood by the Western countries, but is very well understood in the rest of the world. This is the channel of remittances, of the funds that are transferred by the families working abroad to countries, to, to, to their families back home. And since um, the measures that were adopted in Russia um, uh, on the financial sector uh, are specifically targeting uh, the FX, which is foreign exchange and uh, financial transfers abroad. This will have a real consequence for countries uh, such as uh, those located in Central Asia, Caucasus, uh, where many of uh, people living there, they're actually working in Russia on a daily basis, such as uh, Poles uh, in the past a little bit more, now a little bit less used to work in the UK, but a high remittances in flows to Poland from the UK. Uh, and that would be the, uh, that would be, the, these would be the, the channels. However, if, you, if we look from the global perspective, the overall effect at this moment uh, is, is not so high, maybe around 1% of the global GDP. It is high, but it is in a relative terms high. So I will stop here. I see that um, the time is running out. I don't want to monopolize this. Thank you. Professor Tyrovic, what's your take on the impact of this war on the regional and global economy? And what is your view on, um, on this labor market perspective? Uh, the one I mentioned, uh, the hope that is among some of the Polish entrepreneurs and some of the policymakers that refugee crisis would be actually a, a chance to repair the, the Polish labor market. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here. What I would like to start from is uh, an, a, a note of caution, 
And the note of caution is actually by one of your own professors. His name is Ben Moll. And together with co-authors, he was able to use the work he's been doing for a long time to try to estimate what would be the costs in terms of GDP and welfare for Germany to completely cut imports of fossil fuels from Russia. And I'll ask you right now, raise your hand if you think it's above 5% of GDP in Germany. Raise your hand if you think it's above 2%. It's actually 0.3 of a percent. Okay? And it's not that the model is wrong. It's just that we're very afraid. And so we kind of make up those stories that seem so tremendous when in fact economic consequences for the Western world to do much more than we do so far uh, may be very moderate. And that's something that we need to keep in the back of the heads. His name is Ben Moll and he's your professor at LSE. <laughs> he moved from the US, he's an ERC grant recipient, he's not a, you know, he's, it's not magic, it's actual best quality economics that you can have. Um, and now asking, uh, uh, answering your question. Um, we are in uncharted wars, right? So we don't know what's going to happen. And in a sense, the Ukrainian refugees that come to Central and Eastern Europe, they don't know how long they're going to stay. They don't know how they're going to affect um, local environment and how the local environment is going to affect them. If you ask any of them how long they want to stay, all of them say, we want to go home, like as soon as we can. Now, how can you build a career? How can you use your skills? How can you build your human capital? All the stuff that labor economists talk about if your approach is that I'm here just for a second, right? So that's not a way to go. <laughs> and obviously, there's nothing that hosting countries can do to change that because this is their freedom of choice. And I'm sure a big part of them, as soon as they will be able to go back, will do that, right? So can we harness that? Well, if we do good policies and if we know what we're doing and if we're good in reception and welcoming and all that, but we have been really crap at that so far. I mean, the societies were good, but countries were really, really bad. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, we've never experienced big migration waves. We have never been effective in harnessing the energy of immigrants. Traditionally, we have been emigration countries. Um, so that's a huge mental change and it's a huge change in policy that is not, I mean, it's wishful thinking that it will happen by itself. It won't happen by itself. Never in history that we can observe this part of the world, any other part of the world, huge waves of migration didn't become perfect overnight without any intervention, right? So having said that, we tend to live in the world, um, I don't know how about you, but I come from the country where my government never fails to disappoint me. Every day I wake up in the morning and I hope to feel better, but I don't. And that's the reality in very many European countries. It's not just a story of Paul, and it's not just a story of Boris Johnson. It's really the failure of leadership. It's the lack of skill, the lack of competence, the lack of data, the lack of, I don't know, benevolence is the word that comes to my mind. And Really, if we want to make that work, we would need to change our elites, and I don't see that happening, uh, at least not very fast. So I'm not nearly as optimistic as the entrepreneurs that you met, <laughs> and the reason why I'm not is that those entrepreneurs, I think we had this discussion yesterday, it's like seeing the forest and the trees, right? So those entrepreneurs, they're the trees. So, I mean, if the rain falls, they will be fine, right? But it's actually a flawed. It's a huge change to the local structures, and that, has to be managed, and it's not properly managed, and it doesn't seem like it's going to start being managed Monday and I, as I come back to Poland. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Belka, um, the, the inflation uh, uh, Pavel Boris mentioned a de decade uh, of the turbulence, uh, the food crisis, uh, change in the model of globalization. All those things are um, influencing the way uh, prices, the, the, the way that inflation will look like. Do you think that central bankers around the world have effective tools to cope with that new wave of inflation? Well, many haven't even started, like the ECB. So, probably 
when they start using those instruments, we'll see. Uh, but um, looking at the character of, of, of today's inflation, unfortunately, uh, the cost of moderating inflation uh, solely by monetary instruments would be exorbitant. Uh, it takes um, a proper uh, macroeconomic policy mix. So means both from monetary and fiscal uh, instruments. The same goes for Poland. I mean, I probably have been moderately critical of, of the current management of the, of the, of the bank, um, especially at the beginning. Oh. But, but now they are doing what it takes and they will fail because uh, even if it's proper thing to raise the interest rates, nothing can be done effectively uh, without um, support uh, from, from the fiscal policy. But it's very difficult to do it because we are entering probably a period of slower growth. In the case of our country, don't talk about stagflation. We have entered this crisis uh, with the economy zooming at six or seven percent. Come on. So, what happens if we slow down to four? This is not a disaster. We may see disaster in other countries, not in Poland. Which means that it's room for uh, proper anti inflationary measures. There should be money to uh, take care of refugees in terms of adapting some of them or many of them to the Polish society, to the Polish labor market or to the Polish educational system, health system. This money can come from the European Union. We are strongly advocating a completely new instrument in the European Parliament on top of what has been uh, decided so far, which was COVID-related. Uh, new kind of money with different uh, objectives to meet uh, should and I hope will be uh, put in motion. And, well, this could only, this could only strengthen the, uh, what is happening as we see, the fiscal union in the European Union. Long live European federal state. This is, this is, the, this is the answer that we need in the long term? Uh, it's, it's more of a joke because it's not really about federation, but it's about confederation. Thank you very much. Um, Pavel Boris, what kind of um, policies we need, what kind of actions we need to cope with the current um, crisis. I'm not talking about the war in Ukraine, but the crisis, the refugee crisis happening in Central Eastern Europe and um, a potential turbulent decade we are going to experience, as you mentioned. What kind of policy actions we need? As always, uh, it is worth to focus on competitiveness and productivity. Yeah? But, uh, of course, they are, you know, these are macro type of easy words, but it's not easy to really increase competitiveness and productivity in the short term because it's, it's very complicated. So now we are talking from COVID, we are still talking about crisis management, but we at the same time we need to focus on uh, uh, fundamental things. In, in terms of the crisis management, we, have to, we need to help exporters to find the new markets. We have to help importers to, to find new providers of, of components and, and, and other um, uh, goods. The impact on the Polish economy from trade channel would be limited 0.5% maximum. Uh, we have to boost confidence 
uh, because this is important and hopefully the Polish government will come to the agreement with European Union on the recovery plan and we could boost investments next year. It would be extremely important uh, because we further need to invest in the proper infrastructure, in energy um, uh, transformation. And of course, the, the last not, but not least is the new energy policy. Yeah, so um, Europe, I believe, and Poland need to focus on renewables and, uh, and nuclear energy, and we have to speed up the, the investments. And of course, from the competitiveness perspective, education is critical, so uh, this, this, these are areas we need to focus in the coming years. Thank you very much. Mr. Trombinski, IMF um, uh, launched the 1.4 uh, billion dollar emergency funding for, the, uh, for Ukraine, but this is the emergency situation right now. What kind of actions from, uh, uh, from international organizations such as IMF, the World Bank, we should expect in the coming months to cope with the problems you pointed uh, ahead of us? Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, IMF is traditionally associated with financing, but this is not actually what we only do. We actually uh, are dedicating more of our internal resources to helping countries to cope with, uh, with problems, and just by offering them technical assistance, capacity development, but also by uh, ensuring that uh, they can coordinate at the regional level. So um, if I think about the current situation, Financing is only one channel when the international community can help Ukraine to deal with the crisis, as well as it is only one channel as we can help the world to deal with the, with the crisis. And it's not the most important one, at least not at this moment. At this moment, what will be very important is to provide a very accurate and calibrated and country-specific policy advice to countries. Each country will be affected differently and thus the policy advice has to be calibrated according to the needs of each country. And then if there are some of the legacies that, are, that were not addressed, uh, then we can help with technical assistance and we can train them. Um, and maybe I will stop here, but uh, of course there is a lot of other things that, that other organizations can do. Thank you very much. Professor Terovic, you, you are not going to like the question that I'm going to ask you because you, you, you don't like the very general uh, um, the big statements, but nevertheless, I want to ask you that question. Do you think that um, we are right now, as some people want to believe, are uh, observing the, the resurrection of the liberal thinking, the resurrection of the the, the, the triumph of the liberal economy over the state-controlled, state-owned, state-directed economy, as was the Russian example. Do you, do you believe that we might, in this decade of troubles, see the, 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 the revival of the democratic model and uh, the revival of the liberal uh, economy or with the lack of leadership that you pointed out, we are going to, to lose the, the war of ideas with the autocracies. A very general question. I'm sorry for that. But no, no, this is perfectly fine. There is a perfect answer to your question. There is a question and it's 42. Anybody who ever read? It's 42, but uh, <laughs> ignoring that, um, I do agree that we are going to have a prolonged period of turbulence. It's not the first one. Let me remind you, we just finished a decade of turbulence after the global financial crisis. There was like a two years, uh, let's just say lax, <laughs> now we're entering another decade where everybody's going to be uh, on their toes. And there's two things that we can learn from the global financial crisis about the next decade to come, and that is that every small policy, policy mistake that we would have normally ignored because everybody makes mistakes, those mistakes are multiple times more costly at the times of turbulence than in normal times. Normally you have a president, a governor of a central bank, he goes out, says something stupid, nobody pays attention. Say something stupid in times like that, 
you're going to see that immediately on the, on the exchange rate. Uh, have minister go out, say something stupid, pff, nobody cares, right? Now you say something about the planes and suddenly the whole world is talking about the planes. Um, MiG-29s or any other plane. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that this right now is the period in which you can only go through with the, um, you know, the kind of, I just want to say avoid getting your feet wet, but that's not an English expression. But you can only get through with this unscathed if you actually have very merit-based policy. And merit-based policy is not ideological. It's not about having more state or less state, ideologically speaking, but it's about having state where it's actually needed, right? So you do an analysis, which way is better? Do we leave it to people or do we actually try to intervene as the government in any way of policy, right? And what I do feel is that across European countries at least, we are entering more ideological stages, not less ideological ones. And the whole narrative about what's going on with the Ukraine war and with Putin and everything else, this is becoming a narrative that is you know, using very polarizing language, We've heard today comparing Putin to Hitler, abstracting from whether or ignoring whether this is accurate or inaccurate. This is highly emotional narrative. And that's not something conducive to fact-based, knowledge-based, <laughs> analysis-based policy. Um, we are expecting politicians to have answers right away. Let me assure you, I used to work, he was my boss, I used to work for 10 years at the central bank as an analyst. There is no single answer you can give on the spot. Any question that is a meaningful question to which you actually have to have an answer, it takes time. The first answer is usually very wrong. The second one is stupid. It takes time. And when politicians are under pressure of media to give answers right away, and they're not nearly as educated as we were, <laughs> I mean, the analysts, their answers are even, I mean, you see what I'm trying to say? So we're under pressure to give immediate answers in highly polarized situation where what we need is less immediate answers <laughs> in less polarized narrative. Uh, this is a very pessimistic answer in a way because... Sorry. You asked the question. <laughs> now, there is a good part of this. We already know that, right? We didn't know that in 2008 when the global financial crisis started. So in a sense, there is something to build on. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe one thing we can all do is to log out from Twitter or Facebook uh, for a moment, have a longer read. Or at least log out the politicians from there. <laughs> Mr. Putin already succeeded in this front. Uh, uh, we, we don't have m more time. I'm, I'm really, really sorry, that, uh, but, but we have to finish. Thank you very much for the discussion and a strong applause for our... Thank you.